Good afternoon. My name is James Banks, and I'm at the Center for Multicultural Education at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'd like to welcome you to this session called Education, Poverty, and School Reform, Perspectives from the Encyclopedia of the Diversity in Education. The first thing, I, this was a major three-year project that I, of course, it takes a community to create a four-volume reference work with 700 articles. And so I had a huge team of 18 members of an editorial board uh, that I will uh, uh, flash up uh, now. And it, it'll take two slides. But I'd like for them to, if they're in the audience, members of our editorial board, would you please stand so we can acknowledge you? Members of the editorial board. We also have members who contributed to the encyclopedia, about 500 of them around the world. Those of you who contributed to the encyclopedia, would you please stand so we can acknowledge you? In this session, the editorial board uh, consisted of 18 people. When Sage invited and convinced me to, to undertake this project, which I never would have done if I had known how hard it would, was, I'm glad I did it, but I would never do it again. Uh, I, identify, I reviewed the literature, and then I identified 18 topic, topical areas and you'll see half of them on this slide. Can you see that in the back of the room? I always worry about people in the back of the bus because I grew up in the South where I had to ride in the back. So I'm very sensitive to people at the back. Okay, the next slide is the other part of the editorial board who had uh, charge of the 18 sections. How this section, this is how this uh, hour and a half session will be organized. I will first give an overview of the encyclopedia. Then we will hear from Professor Sonia Naito, who at the University of Massachusetts, who was also a contributor as well as on the editorial board. We'll hear from Professor Curtis, Curtis Carter from Stanford, who was on the editorial board as well as a contributor. Uh, this is being streamed, and she reminded me I need to speak into the uh, microphone. Then Lois Weiss, who was a contributor from the University of Buffalo. Then we'll hear from Mar Marilyn Cockton-Smith, who was on our editorial board and a contributor. And then we will hear from my dear friend, Linda Darlin Hammond, who always contributes every time I ask her, uh, who was contributed nicely to this volume. In 19, 2009, uh, please come up front. There are some seats up front. There are a few seats up front, so please, you won't embarrass us by coming up looking for them. In 2009, Sage invited me to develop an encyclopedia on diversity in education that would consist of approximately 700 entries in four volumes to be published both electronically and in a bound edition. I did a broad review of the literature and identified 18 topical areas, and I then identified 18 section editors. Each section editor was asked to identify 50 concepts and terms, and this generated about 900 possible entries. And through a complex editing process, we were able to get this list down to 700. The major goal of this encyclopedia is to, is to describe the theories, research, policies, case studies, and programs at the preschool through the post-secondary level and their implication for reform. We conceptualize diversity broadly in the encyclopedia to include not just race and ethnicity, or gender, 
but also to include exceptionality, language, sexual orientation, ethnic identity, social class, and the way that these factors intersected and interacted. That was a major assumption of all of the section editors and me as the general editor. So we saw these issues as very dynamic. And we used the word intersectionality, a word that came, came out of gender studies, to really show how these factors intersect. Another major characteristic of the encyclopedia was to show global dimensions. Of the 18 section editors, three were responsible for entries outside of the United States. So it has a strong global dimension. We had an editor for Europe, an editor for Asia, and an editor for the Middle East. And so the global dimension was very significant. And helping students to develop global identifications, cultural identifications, national identifications, and regional, and how these intersect and interacted was really critical because we see ethnicity and diversity as global issues. And we think that we've done a pretty good job of trying to make these interrelate. And we just got the good news last week that the encyclopedia has been listed by the American Library Association as one of the best references of 2012. And with those comments, I'll turn it over to my dear colleague of many decades, I won't say how many, many decades, Professor Sonia Nieto. Come on, Jim, it hasn't been that long. It's a few years ago that we got together. So uh, I'm here to talk with you about multicultural education as the vehicle for creating equity for students in poverty. And that was not my, uh, what I did for the encyclopedia. What I did was on multicultural education K-12. But I wanted to fit it into this, uh, into this session and into the theme, which I think is right on, something that we need to pay attention to, that we haven't paid enough attention to. Um, so uh, defining ideal of the United States, uh, dating as far back as the mid-19th century, is that public schools could be, in the words of Horace Mann, the great equalizer. Man, a key player in the push for universal free and compulsory education, believed that students of all social class and cultural backgrounds, but European to be sure, should share equally in the benefits of a public education. The great educational philosopher John Dewey also made an explicit connection between democracy and education, arguing that education should be available to children of all social classes although I don't believe he ever included children of color in his designation of all. Serving the needs of students living in poverty has been chief among the battles to equalize educational opportunities, however, and multicultural education has been in the forefront of these battles since the 1970s. In fact, it can even be said that the quintessential battles over public schooling from the 19th century to the present has centered on questions of equality and injustice of all kinds, although it was only because of the efforts of African Americans and later others of various backgrounds uh, that these were finally taken seriously. So from its origins in early African American intellectual thought to the work of Latino and Latina, uh, American Indian, Asian, and progressive white educators and activists to the civil rights movement and to recent developments in feminism, critical race theory, postmodernism, and postcolonialism, multicultural education has remained true to its fundamental ideals of equity and equality for students of all backgrounds. But the struggle for multicultural education goes beyond the classroom walls to implicate societal change as a fundamental goal. The ethnic studies, gender, bilingual education, disability, and labor studies movements, most of, most of which began in the 1960s, also emerged from the civil rights movement and were imbued with a deep sense of equity and social justice and with a commitment to improving the life chances through education of children who had been neglected by their schooling. Although some of these movements were forerunners of multicultural education, they were at the same time parallel movements to it. 
and have remained viable fields in their own right. None of them, including multicultural education, however, has focused exclusively uh, and explicitly on poverty and class. And as a result, these issues often get short shrift. So in the few minutes I have today, I want to consider both the implications and the limits of multicultural education for addressing poverty. And uh, the way that I'd like to do this is to use the framework of the dimensions of multicultural education developed by James Banks, uh, because these, these dimensions have been really uh, important in defining the field. So I want to suggest some implications for addressing poverty. The dimensions include content integration, knowledge construction, prejudice reduction, equity pedagogy, and empowering school culture and social structure. Content in integration can be defined as the extent to which content from a variety of cultures and groups is integrated into the curriculum. In the case of poverty and working class history, it's clear that these perspectives have been nearly entirely left out of the public school curriculum. The contribution of multicultural education has been to both uncover and create these curricula. We now have rich resources from organizations such as Rethinking Schools, Teaching for Change, Teaching Tolerance, the Zinn Education Project, uh, and, and a few others that include multiple perspectives that were invisible in the past, including the history of workers, the role of unions, and unmistakable and persistent poverty since before the founding of the nation. Knowledge construction. Knowledge construction is the extent to which teachers and students understand how the perspectives, uh, biases, and frames of reference in particular disciplines help uh, shape knowledge in these disciplines. These include both positive and negative consequences of these perspectives. For example, the infamous, quote, culture of poverty and the deficit theories developed in the fields of anthropology and sociology in the 1960s and still evident today. Prejudice reduction concerns the way in which teachers help students develop positive and anti-biased attitudes about people of different backgrounds. The materials and curricula, both national and global, from the organizations I mentioned previously are especially relevant here, as is the growing field of multicultural children's literature that takes up these topics. Equity pedagogy refers to how teachers modify pedagogical strategies to help students of all backgrounds learn effectively. This means using a variety of ways to teach, including project-based, collaborative, and research-based approaches. And finally, an empowering school culture and social structure. This dimension defines whether and how the climate and organization of the school promote an equitable learning environment or not. So this includes policies and practices, such as family outreach, engaging pedagogy, innovative curricula, the hiring of staff of diverse backgrounds, fair and equitable assessment, flexible grouping, and others. This dimension is a particularly tricky one given the skill and drill culture in which we currently find ourselves, a culture that is defined by high-stakes testing, rigid accountability, and market-driven approaches to public education, and not even multicultural education can have a sizable impact when this is the case which brings me to the limits of multicultural education for addressing poverty. Schools alone cannot solve the problem of poverty. Poverty is a multi-dimensional, deeply entrenched, and structural problem that's been created and is sustained and perpetuated by inequality, and also by the vested interests of those with power, unequal access to education, and educational policies such as such as inequitable school uh, financing, large class size, rigid pedagogy, and unengaging curricula. The link between equal education and poverty is a complex one, including high unemployment, inadequate health care, poor housing, and other social problems. And until we decide as a nation that we refuse to accept this inequality, no approach or strategy can turn things around. Teachers can, of course, help. That's what my work is about, and I know the work of a lot of people here. Otherwise, we would just you know, turn around and leave. Um, and, and so can teacher educators who work to service and practicing teachers to understand poverty. But av as we've seen uh, and been reminded by the work of Jean Anion, David Berliner, Richard Rothstein, Lois Weiss, 
and most recently by Jeannie Oakes in her brilliant talk here last evening, among many others, students living in poverty will only have a better chance at an equal and high quality education if macroeconomic policies change. In the end, it will only be through a strong social movement of teachers, unions, community members, and others who care about our nation's youth that things will change. The high stakes tech culture, for example, mostly affects students living in poverty and attending high poverty schools. The example of the teachers at Garfield High School in Seattle who began boycotting the MAP, the Measures of Academic Pro uh, Progress, on December 21st is worth noting. Teachers and students are taking up the call, reminding us once again that it's only through actions such as these that challenge the status quo that poverty or any social problem will be addressed. Multicultural education alone will not and cannot bring about the change that we need. Thank you. Sonia Naito not only delivers, but she obeys guidelines. <laughs> right on the button. It is my pleasure to introduce really one of our younger scholars in the next generation, Professor Prudence Carter at Stanford University. Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, that was so tepid. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you. I'm a Southern girl, so I'm accustomed to a little bit of call and response. Although, what I'm about to say today is not very, um, it's not one that calls for a lot of humor in any way. Let me start with a metaphor, and I ask it as a rhetorical question. And that is this, how do we expect children who are taking broken stairs to the top, there are holes, perhaps potholes, and missing steps, and we're asking them to get to the top of a building. And we're comparing them to kids who are on smooth sailing escalators and are rapidly moving elevators. How do we expect the outcomes to be the same in terms of the time, the time they reach to the top? And then when we think about these kids who are on those broken stairways, we have to ask ourselves, who are they? And the thing that we know, I forgot about that. Thank you. The thing that we know is that the poverty has increased in this country. More children live in poverty today than ever. About a third, 24% of the total population of individuals in this society are children, and more than a third of those who are poor our children. And then when we go even further and look at the distribution of kids who are in this country, actually I'll go back to this one, that this is the one I want, broken down by race and ethnicity, we see that in absolute terms, more than five million children living in poverty are white children. Now numerically speaking, less than that are African-American or black, and more are Latino, over six million children. But what is really problematic is the proportions of these populations. While 12% of white children live in poverty, more than three times as many of those who are black live in poverty, and about three times as many of those who are Hispanic or Latino live in poverty. And this is what we refer to as the racialization of poverty or the color of poverty the gross and disproportionate percentages of children who are black and brown living in poverty. And then even further, when we look at the number of kids who are in our public schools, and we see that the distribution of students who are in public schools has gone down for some groups, particularly white youth, and it's gone up for other youth. And those students are much more likely to be in schools where the material resource context is not as great, where there is a high, high percentage of other students who come from similar socioeconomic backgrounds who come from poverty. And then here's another one. If we think about the percentage of those children, particularly by race and ethnicity and poverty, who are living in households where there are at least two 
earners in the household, where there are two parents, that's the big indicator what we look at, and we see that it is becoming increasingly more normative for children who are from black families to live in households where there are not two parents, but one parent. Um, and it's also, so if you look at the percentage, it's about a third of black children live in two family households, two parent households, compared to more than 75% um, of white youth and about 65% of Latino youth and maybe half of Native American and um, Alaskan Native students or youth in this country. So those are the kind of like descriptive statistics broadly, and any of you can get that. And I, for my few minutes that I have left here today, and I wrote about at-risk at learners, there are all kinds of at-risk learners, but specifically today thinking about those who are poor. There are four things that I want to say. One is that I, even if I'm referred to as a young researcher, I've been doing this for over a decade now, and I sincerely believe that we have enough research to know what the problems are. Number two, we understand what the consequences and the pains and woes of poverty are from many of the poverty research scholars who have been out there. And we know that from the narratives that we can read in various accounts and publications across the country. But here, perhaps, is the most difficult question. And that is the question of whether or not we have the political will to close the opportunity gaps that are presented to our youth in this country. And I'm thinking today, as I woke up, I was listening to the radio this morning about what we're grappling with here in the state of California, for example, when the question of equity and financial resources are on the table and how there is so much pushback, even within the party that is supposed to be supporting equity in education and the, the amelioration of impoverished conditions, struggling over the distribution of resources for those who have and those who don't have. So I ask the question to be provocative today is can we as scholars and researchers move beyond the problematization and attempting to explain, and pardon me quantitative researchers, 100% of the variance of those who are poor or not in terms of the academic disparities and instead get to the interventions, get to the things that would actually increase and improve the political will so that we can make it possible for all kids to either be on those escalators or those elevators. And that, I would suspect to you, will make a fairer, will enable us to have a fairer conversation about what we call in terms of the so-called achievement gap or the achievement disparities than the one that we're having today without thinking about the contextual conditions in which these kids live. So more recently, my colleague Kevin Wellner and I put together a, a very illustrious group of scholars and researchers to think about how we might close the opportunity gap. And since I'm supposed to stand here today, and some of them may be in the room, but there's also going to be a session just to uh, do a bit of self-promotion tomorrow morning on this, on closing the opportunity gap, there are a few things that I want to leave you with, because as Professor Nieto said, this is not just about what's going on in schools. It's not hard to see how poverty is related to education. A child without high quality preschool, for example, faces even greater obstacles if she is also without good health care and dental care. If her parents have no stable employment, if their housing situation is unsure and transient, if her school has inexperienced and poorly trained teachers who themselves are unlikely to remain at the school for long, if the intervention required for low test scores at her school hinges on a turnaround approach that results in even more churn, if the school also faces overcrowding and has serious maintenance issues, if technology and learning materials are spotty and outdated, if she shunted into dead-end, low-track classes that do, in fact, evidence a soft bigotry of low expectations, if educators and others do not understand her family's cultural or linguistic background and assume that these are deficits that cannot be built upon, and if her neighborhood is not safe, segregated, limited resources, and if it has few enrichment opportunities after school or over the so, uh, summer, and on and on and on. So I encourage you, I encourage us as a community to think about how we can retool this discussion, this debate, when we think about those who are at risk. 
it's not just about a so-called achievement gap. We're dealing with opportunity gaps. We're dealing with broken stairways versus those who are on fast-paced, smooth sailing escalators and rapidly moving and lifting elevators. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Carter. And when I call you a young researcher, I meant compared to the rest of us. Um, and of course, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Um, the, uh, the next speaker is Professor Lois Weiss, who of course has pioneered the concept of researching social class. And it's my pleasure to present my dear friend and colleague, Professor Lois Weiss, University of Buffalo. Thanks, Jim, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, everyone will let, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make sure I still have, I'm not so young. <laughs> um, in a recent piece on the widening academic achievement gap, and here I'm defining it as the income difference between a child born in a family at the 90th percentile of the family income distribution and a child from the family of the 10th percentile. Sean Reardon draws upon data from 19 representative studies, if you can imagine that, to assess the relationship between income and academic achievement over time, probing the extent to which the documented widening achievement gap, inequality of the last 40 years in the US, has been paralleled by a similar increase in the income achievement gradient. Reardon concludes as follows. The achievement gap between children from high and low income families is roughly 30 to 40 percent higher among children born in 2001 than among those born 25 years earlier. Additionally, the income achievement gap is nearly twice as large as the black-white achievement gap in contrast to 50 years ago when the black-white achievement gap was one to one and a half to two times as high as the income gap. So the context has changed. It's becoming worse. The inequalities of income are paralleled by the inequalities in academic achievement attainment and opportunity structures that my colleagues here were talking about. Um, both Professor uh, Nieto and Professor Carter, as well as my other colleagues on the panel, will certainly have a lot to say about the mechanisms through which this is produced. And this is very, very important to keep in mind. But what I will suggest here is that even a focus on this really extraordinary corpus of work cannot possibly explain the massive intensification of this gap, which is now 30 to 40 times higher over the past 40 to 50 years. Such intensification must be understood in light of new global realities that affect those with privilege as well as those without, in the sense that new realities work to convince parents that particularly located forms of education have both become increasingly critical at one and the same time as good in quotes, education has become increasingly scarce. For example, since the 1970s, we've witnessed the massive realignment of the global economy. In the first wave of this realignment, working class jobs, primarily in manufacturing, were increasingly exported from highly industrialized countries such as the US, UK, Japan, and so forth, to poor countries where internet, where multinational companies can hire skilled and unskilled laborers at lower pay and without benefits. In the second current wave, as we all know, middle class jobs are also exported as members of a new and expanded middle class in countries such as India, China, Mexico are educated as architects, accountants, medical technicians, and doctors, and are willing to work at least at the moment, we don't know how this long this is gonna last, for multinational companies at a fraction of the salary they would earn for the same work at corporate headquarters. This evolving set of human relations and economic relations changes the context within every in with in with within which inequalities are being produced, maintained, and struggled over. Given the realities of the new global economy, this is accompanied by the intensified privilege of particular kinds of educational credentials, at one and the same time as access to and availability of such credentials becomes more widely distributed across the globe. This is setting this is an entirely new context in which we live now. I don't have time to go into all the intricacies of this new context, but this is now a global marketplace for all sorts of things, including admissions to any kind of college and university. This results in heightened levels of anxiety among parents and students with regard to future class positions. 
anxieties that they seek to resolve the entrance to particular kinds of post-secondary destinations, in the case of the upper middle class in particular, a set, of, uh, a set of destinations that demand, given heightened competition, intensified preparation at the K-12 level. Stories about the lengths to which parents of middle and upper middle class children are willing to go in light of this complete, increasingly competitive college admissions process flourish in the popular press. We've all read about it. My argument is these must be understood as fundamental class processes rather than some kind of craziness, on the, simple craziness, excuse me, on the part of upper middle class parents. For example, a recent New York Times article highlights the rising trend among parents to enroll their two-year-old children in Kuhlman classes. We've all seen Race for the Top. Excuse me, we've all seen Race to Nowhere, where a young child reflects on the dizzying array of homework, sorry about the, um, and scheduled activities that undergird their life. Lamenting the loss of this time, of free time, one child notes, a little child notes, everything's now about preparing for school. My point here is that those with privilege have not been standing still in the face of the things that, that my wonderful colleagues have been discussing. Although factors noted earlier with regard to stark inequalities in the provision of educational opportunities as now coupled with severe disinvestment in poor communities and schools is an egregious set of needs, and America should be held accountable for these things. Such inequalities are now accompanied by the fact that those with privilege are stepping up their game, mobilizing all available economic, social, cultural capital so as to position their children for future advantage. Poverty, privilege, and class structure more generally are being made and remade all over the world as we speak. And the actions and activities of the relatively privileged, and here I'm not talking just about the top 1%. I'm mostly talking about the top 20% who reaped the benefit of the income redistribution in the United States in the 1980s and the 1990s, an income redistribution which has continued and which, of course, this particular group of people would like it to continue more. Um, it was part and parcel of the fundamental restructuration, reconstruction of class structure and class cultural sensibility that privilege some and disadvantage others. My point then is that the production of education and economic inequalities through schools can never be understood just in with reference to the poor and working class. We must understand what the privileged are doing at one and the same time. So let me just make a couple brief comments here. And I call this a brief but specific focus on privilege with targeted reference to post-secondary education, peering beneath the mantra of, uh, of, of, of college for all. Um, let me just make a, a real quick point here. Uh, we, we have uh, Kristen Chipalone, Heather Jenkins, and I have a book coming out. It's sort of in draft form now. It'll be out next year with the University of Chicago Press on the production of the new upper middle class. The pivot, I know all about Kuhlman. I know all about what's going on in Manhattan, trying to get privileged kids into particular kinds of preschools and that sort of race. At the same time, the real race is around the secondary to post-secondary transition where people are, are moving so intently and so purposely to, to position themselves, their children, the next generation, they're making very, very key steps. So um, by turning our scholarly attention disproportionately to the ways in which education institutions work or do not work, all of which is very important work, by the way, to marginalize and to open up opportunities for the historically disenfranchised, we're ignoring the ways in which educational institutions work explicitly and increasingly on behalf of the relatively privileged as well as the ways in which privileged groups work hard on a day-to-day, week-by-week, month-by-month basis to maintain what Pierre Bourdieu calls distinction. Here I'm going to focus briefly on issues related to post-secondary education in light of the mantra for college is for all, and the extent to which those with privilege are targeting preparation for and access to particularly located institutions under conditions of massification of higher education. And this is particularly most competitive and highly competitive plus, as per the Barron's classification, which is a selectivity index. That's what these privileged parents are doing. That's what everybody's heading for. Barron's and those kinds of ranking systems are instantiating that race because they're, they're, they're marking particular institutions as being both valuable and very, very sadly for someone like me who teaches at a state, I've been at state institutions, public institutions all my life, there are only six public institutions, including our top, top public, in the category of most competitive institutions in Barron's. And the number of institutions categorized as most competitive is something like 89, if I have the exact figure that I just can't remember. Things don't change when we go to highly competitive. Plus, they're almost all private. And they're not just the Ivies. Now, there's not enough room in all these Ivies any longer. So what people are doing is trying to position for the next layer down, but they're still private. 
A couple more points, and I'm going to wrap up. In the United in, light, in this context, in the United States, working class and poor children are, in fact, entering colleges and universities in a greater number than ever before. They are not necessarily finishing, but they are getting in there. While research on linkages between type and selectivity of post-secondary institution attended is certainly not new, that's been going on for 30 years now, evidence suggests that the class-related gap in type of institution attended is widening under conditions of massification. Massification of education does not necessarily mean that more people get opportunities. The opportunities are equalized. In fact, evidence from all over the world is suggesting that this is in fact not the case. Thomas and Bell demonstrate that while less privileged students increasingly attend higher education, attendance at the most selective such institutions and increasingly the flagship publics is comprised of the children of the privileged population. The old land grant sort of uh, uh, um, uh, image of people coming from the poor and working class to enter land grant state flagship institutions is just about gone. Because people, if you look around your campuses, you will know what I'm talking about. People coming into those campuses now are by and large privileged. This becomes critically important in light of the fact that where one attends college exerts long-term effects. Bowen, Chingles, and McPherson note differential persistence in graduation rates by selectivity of institution, holding constant the entering characteristics of students and express concern for what they call undermatching. Students, quote unquote, choosing not to attend the best college they can get into by virtue of their college dossier thereby fundamentally decreasing their chances of persistence and graduation simply by virtue of where they go to school. Selectivity of institution in and of itself matters then with regard to outcomes. Beyond higher rates of persistence and graduation, we also know that selective institutions are better resourced than less selective institutions. This is increasingly so, and the, the, the private, um, the, 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 the um, most prestigious Privates are pulling ahead of the pack in ways that is unprecedented in, in the history of the United States. And confer on their graduates both special entree to the best graduate and professional programs in the country, doc, well-documented labor advantages. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, this, is what, this, is, this is what's going on. We are, I mean, we are all being restructured. We all know it if we have anything to do with schools or colleges or universities or have children or every one of us is being restructured. But in that, it's not, a, it's not a random restructuring. The restructuring means that the privileged are getting more and the less privileged are getting less. So I'm going to wrap up. The production of education and economic inequalities through schools can never be understood with sole reference to the poor and working class. Or in the case of US, people of color. Here I've just scratched the surface with regard to the ways in which and the extent to which those with privilege are now running harder and faster to position the next generation for advantage under increasingly competitive circumstances. And circumstances that are, are setting, setting the stage for it, intense anxieties among children and parents. The dearth of opportunities for the poor and working class is palpable. And we need to continue to highlight them as we work toward amelioration of inequalities. However, we must be mindful of the fact that in this new global context, many attempts to ameliorate inequalities are going to be met by heightened anxiety among the privileged, a heightened set of anxieties that are going to work to further encourage those with privilege to increase their own investment in the future of education. It's only by focusing across the social structure rather than concentrating solely on those who are marginalized that we're going to be able to gain a fuller picture of the landscape of inequality and the mechanisms through which privilege is both maintained and denied and that are setting the stage for what really is going to be in place in the 21st century, I fear, for decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lois Weiss, who always condenses complex ideas into 10 minutes quite well. Uh, the next speaker is Professor Marilyn Cochran Smith, who has been working with me for uh, um, uh, more than a decade and who always answers the call when I ask her to participate. Professor Marilyn Cochran Smith from Boston College. Good afternoon. Uh, the facts and figures that describe changes in the school population over the last 25 years or so are probably quite familiar to most of the people in this room. But they're still dramatic, and I think they're still worth repeating. And Prudence Carter even mentioned some of these a minute ago, and I'm still going to repeat some of them. 
partly as a result of the mass movement of people across the world, students of color currently account for over 44% of total enrollments in elementary and secondary schools. And this is up from 22% in 1972. In addition, 16 million children in the US, or 22% of all children, live in poverty. This is up from an all-time low of 14% in 1969. About half of poor children live in extreme poverty. And children represent a disproportionate share of the poor. They are 24% of the total population, but 36% of the poor. Historically, schools haven't succeeded in educating poor students and students of color on par with their white, more affluent, native English-speaking peers. Historically, teacher preparation programs haven't succeeded in preparing teachers with the knowledge, experience, commitment, and skills to challenge persistent disparities in students' educational opportunities and outcomes. Now, at the same time that these demographic and poverty level changes have occurred, there has been an unprecedented emphasis on teacher quality in major education policies. Now, there's the expectation that teachers should be able to teach all students to world-class standards and also help me meet new social goals related to diversity. Now, it's generally assumed that teachers are critical factors, if not the critical factor, in producing a well-qualified labor force and at the same time helping to reduce social inequality. These assumptions, of course, are arguable. I have argued against them. Sonia Nieto mentioned uh, this point as well. Uh, as she suggested, and I would certainly agree with, teachers alone and teacher educators alone cannot fix all these problems and challenges and issues of the school. Nevertheless, we have an obligation to make efforts in this area. The encyclopedia entry that I'm drawing on for this presentation focuses on the preparation of teachers to teach the current diverse student population, including students in low income and poor schools. Now, I want to start in, in sort of an odd way. Jim will forgive me, I think. And that is by talking about two things that are not part of my encyclopedia entry and that actually aren't features of encyclopedia entries in general. I just want to note, and you may or may not know this, that encyclopedia entries present a broad overview of a topic, not a fully nuanced discussion that directly refers to and sort of talks back to other writing or that takes a particular position. Um, a second thing that encyclopedia entries can't provide, almost by definition, is rich detail, since they don't usually include examples or cases. To give some richness, then, to this topic, I want to offer two quick glimpses of teacher candidates and the jobs that they took immediately upon graduation from their teacher preparation programs. This will give you a sense of what some of the challenges are. These are real people, although not their real names and not their real photos. But this is based on some research I've done with colleagues. Lola Werner is a white European-American young woman who herself attended well-resourced suburban schools with a primarily white population. Her first year teaching job was at an urban K-8 school where she taught 7th and 8th grade science. The student population was 72% low income, 70% African American or Latina, 14% students with special needs. For the 7th and 8th graders, the population was 89% African American or Latina. For some of these students, this was a last resort or last chance school. Sylvie Lee is a Chinese American woman and a native speaker of Mandarin. Her first teaching job right out of preparation was in an urban elementary school in the heart of the city's Chinatown district. 70% of the students in her school spoke languages other than English at home, including Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, Korean and Spanish. 50% of all the students in her school were what the school district called limited English proficient. 
11% of the school population was African American, another 11% was Hispanic. 82% of the students lived at or below the poverty level, with many immigrant parents working in very low-paying restaurant and similar kinds of jobs. 17% of the students had been identified as having learning disabilities. Now, I use these two examples of Lola and Sylvie to give flesh and blood to an encyclopedia entry and to suggest that the information any encyclopedia entry offers has to be interpreted in relation to the very real nuances and complexities of the larger social and historical context and has to be connected to the current political climate and the current accountability regime that dominates the school agenda. With all of that as background, the encyclopedia entry I'm drawing from identifies six main strategies that are used in the US to try to prepare teachers to teach diverse student populations, including students in low income and hard to staff schools, and including students living in poverty. Now, I wanna make this point very clear to be sure not all of these strategies are present in every or even any teacher preparation program. Rather, the utilization of these strategies depends on the specific missions of programs and pathways, their institutional and policy context, and their theories of action about how teachers learn to teach, how school change occurs, and whether school factors, that is teachers and school leaders, are considered the major problem and the major solution to school inequalities, or whether larger social factors are recognized. So with all of that said as a kind of qualifier, the six identified strategies include values, frameworks, missions, and standards, coursework, community experiences, clinical experiences, recruitment, and research. And I'm gonna talk about each of these very basically almost with one-liners that provide just a bit of information. Another thing you might not know about encyclopedia entries is that they do not include references. So they have at the end a list of further reading, but it was a challenge, I know, as one of the editors, for many people to figure out how to write like that because that's not what we're used to doing. So a few words about these strategies. Strategy one is professional, institutional, or programs, values, frameworks, mission statements, and standards that focus on diversity. These are used to take a public stance about how and why diversity is a valued part of teaching and learning, not a deficit. Strategy two is coursework. In addition to teaching teacher candidates how to work with English language learners and students with special needs, for example, coursework is intended to help teacher candidates challenge common assumptions about educational meritocracy, white normativity, color blindness, reasons for growing income inequality that Lois Weiss just talked about, and racism as a solved problem of the past. So coursework is supposed to challenge all of those things. Strategy three is guided community experiences in settings like family literacy projects, soup kitchens, after school programs, community centers, and community action groups. Part of the point here is to change the usual classroom power dynamics by giving teacher candidates the opportunity to see students in contexts where their values, knowledge traditions, strengths, and priorities are regarded as resources by the others around them, not as deficits. The fourth strategy is well-supervised clinical experiences in diverse schools where teacher candidates engage directly in practice and learn from practice. The intention here is for teacher candidates to learn with and from their more experienced teacher mentors. The idea is that they learn how to develop cultural competence, how to provide culturally responsive curriculum, pedagogy, and assessments, and learn specific strategies for working with diverse student populations. The fifth strategy is recruiting a diverse teaching force for urban, high need, and other schools using a variety of recruitment uh, tools. Less attention, however, 
has been given to the preparation of future candidates of color once they're in programs, often with the problematic assumption, one of my doctoral students, Laura Chavez Moreno, is working on an interesting paper along these lines, often with the problematic assumption that their presence in the teaching force is enough and that we don't have to pay so much attention to how we prepare them once we get them in to programs. Finally, there's a substantial amount of research on teacher candidates learning to teach diverse school populations over time and in multiple settings. One important thing to know here is that much of this research focuses on teacher candidates' expectations, beliefs, dispositions, and attitudes. Now, all of that work is very important, but there's much less emphasis and much less attention to actual practice, performance in the classroom, and even to career trajectories, so what happens to people once they enter into these various kinds of teaching settings. I just want to close, I think I still have a tiny bit of time. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to close by saying that this is an overview. And uh, there is a rich and really nuanced body of research that supports or challenges or uh, complexifies each of these six strategies that I have been talking about. And I would uh, recommend that you take up that, that body of work because it really is very interesting. These strategies make it sound very sort of simple and clear. Let's go do these six things. Uh, that, that's not the way it's working. And so I think there's a great deal more work to be done here. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marilyn Cochran Smith, who covered a lot of ground in, in about uh, 11 minutes. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce my dear, dear friend, Professor Linda Darlin Hammond who um, her book, The Flat World in Education, of course, is one of the best sellers. And if you don't have a copy, run and buy one from Teachers College Press. They're here. But she also wrote a beautiful article for our encyclopedia. Uh, every time I hear Linda, I learn and grow. And I look forward to listening to her, Professor Linda Darlene Hammond from Stanford University. So of course, uh, Jim and all of the uh, editors in particular are to be congratulated on this massive accomplishment. Uh, yes. And you heard Jim say that he was not going to do this again. Now before the session started, some of us at the end of the table were talking about how Jim has said that before, about other massive volumes that he has recruited us to contribute to. Uh, and we hope that he really means it this time when he says he won't do this again uh, so, that, so that we can also s start our retirements. <laughs> stop so we can stop. But this is an amazing, um, amazing piece of work and a, an enormous contribution. I'm going to take a slightly different um, attack, uh, stance to this, which is to look at how some other countries have dealt with poverty. Uh, and education, and uh, what strategies they've used to become more high achieving and more equitable in their educational outcomes, while we have become, relative to others in the world, lower achieving and less equitable. Uh, because there are alternatives to the ways in which we have approached education policy, and it seems to me uh, that we can learn from others who have tackled the problems differently. Uh, in the flat world in education, I do talk in particular about three nations, uh, Finland, South Korea, and Singapore. If you look at the PISA rankings, the Program in International Student Achievement, they are typically holding down the top three slots in science, mathematics, and uh, reading uh, for most of the years since between 2000 uh, and 2012. Uh, so there's something that's been going on there, and this was a surprise when PISA first came out uh, to all of the countries, but particularly to the Finns, who became the top scoring OECD nation, and they will tell you that they were never trying to become number one, they were just trying to be ahead of Sweden. <laughs> and interestingly, Sweden used to be thought of as one of the highest achieving nations 
in the world and is now uh, much lower ranked, uh, more comparably to the United States, because they pursued a set of policies very much like our own. Uh, privatization, uh, charters and voucher type experiments, uh, increased standardized testing and deprofessionalization of teaching there. Uh, outcomes became much more inequitable and overall less um, high. And Finland, meanwhile, was pouring money into the public education system in a highly equitable fashion. The Finland Ministry of Education in 2009 uh, made this statement, the aim of Finnish education policy is a coherent policy geared to educational equity, a high level of education among the population as a whole, the principle of lifelong learning uh, entails that everyone has sufficient learning skills and opportunities to develop their knowledge and skills, and that public commitment to education extends in a lifelong fashion with governmental support for the learning of people throughout their lives in Finland. Uh, in Korea, uh, an analysis of the uh, Korean education system's uh, increase over time, its improvement, uh, noted that two distinctive features of Korean education are worth noting, the egalitarian ideal and the zeal for education. Uh, since the modern school was introduced in Korea, the government was keen to ensure equal opportunity for all, regardless of gender, religion, geographic location, or socioeconomic class, and so on. And in uh, Singapore, the motivating driver has been in this tiny little city, state, nation uh, that uh, exists uh, in the, um, you know, right off uh, near Malaysia, uh, the people are the only natural resource. And so the efforts to um, in, invest in the people have been uh, extensive. I'm going to give you just a couple of insights about each of these places uh, so that you have a sense of, uh, about how this kind of investment unfolded. Uh, let me take South Korea first. Uh, in 1945, Korea was liberated from Japanese occupation, but the Korean War followed almost immediately thereafter. 80% of school buildings were destroyed between 1950 and 1953. Uh, despite this, uh, when uh, they began to rebuild after the Korean War, the government start, sought to put in place the plans that had been conceptualized in 1948, many years earlier, by the Korean Education Committee. Uh, and uh, the major strategy was first to attain universal primary education in the 1950s and then to remove the examinations that had prevented many people from moving on to middle school and moving on to high school. And that's actually a theme in all three nations. All three of them removed restrictive examination systems that had produced either extensive tracking or the inability of individuals to move on uh, and access middle and high school education. Uh, and then um, they ex eliminated the exam for entry to high school in 1974. Uh, there was concern then, as there continues to be today, about examination hell, because there's still one exam left, uh, and that's the one that uh, cre uh, determines what kind of college access um, students will have, and the government uh, has been working to try to reduce uh, the emphasis on that uh, as well. But the rapid democratization of access to education was accompanied by great investments in the uh, professionalization of teaching. So teaching is a high status profession. Uh, it is, uh, uh, teachers are brought in and given uh, high quality preparation completely at government expense, as in Singapore and Finland, uh, where that is also true. They get um, a stipend or a salary while they train. Uh, and then they get a lifetime credential in Korea uh, that uh, supports them throughout their entire career. Uh, whereas in 1970, only 20% of Korean young people attended high school, by 2005, over 90% were graduates. So they are now graduating well over 90% of uh, their young people compared to about 70 or 75% in the United States, which has been sort of flatlined since the 1970s. 82% uh, move on to college, to higher education, and of those, most of them graduate, leaving them uh, almost double our college graduate rates uh, at this moment in history. In Finland, uh, which has been a poster child for school improvement since it rapidly climbed to the top of the international rankings after it emerged from the Soviet Union strategies, uh, more than 99% of students now 
successfully complete basic compulsory education, about 90% complete upper secondary school. Two thirds of these enroll in universities uh, are professionally oriented polytechnic schools, again, far more than in the United States. Um, this is after uh, Finland uh, 40 years ago had an agrarian economy, uh, which they were kind of considered, uh, please excuse me, are there any Finns in the audience? They were kind of considered the dummies of Scandinavia. Now, there's a lot of competition in Scandinavia, I've learned, between the Norwegians and the Swedes and the Finns uh, about uh, education and other things. Uh, but there was not um, a highly educated uh, population in Finland. Uh, and this transformation occurred in a rapid way with amazing investments in public education, but also in the welfare of children. Uh, children are supported with free early childhood support. Parents are supported to stay home with their kids if that's what they want to do. Uh, children are supported with free, high-quality child care, tremendous investment in taking care of the needs of uh, special needs students uh, and young people, uh, and then uh, this investment in public education, undergirded primarily by an amazing investment in the qualifications of teachers uh, who receive this two-year master's degree in teaching uh, that focuses on how do you teach uh, students primarily who struggle to learn. There's a strong emphasis on the theory that uh, those who, um, uh, if you learn to teach those uh, who uh, are more difficult to teach, you'll learn to teach all children, and that has um, bear, born fruit. Uh, right now, Finland has about a 5% variation in achievement between and among schools, whereas the average variation among other OECD nations is about 33%. And this is true even in the schools which have large numbers of immigrants. Uh, there are schools in Helsinki where more than 50% of young people have immigrated from other countries. The most rapidly growing newcomer groups are from Afghanistan, Bosnia, India, Iran, Iraq, Serbia, Somalia, Turkey, Thailand, and Vietnam. Those schools continue to be keeping pace with other schools in Finland in their outcomes, uh, not only because of the equitable investments in high-quality teaching uh, and schooling in, in all of those schools, but also the equitable investments in healthcare uh, and a multicultural philosophy. The national curriculum in Finland has a multicultural orientation. Uh, there's an expectation that everyone will become trilingual. Uh, you always speak Finnish, uh, learn English, and keep a mother tongue. Wherever there are at least three children in a school who speak a common language, they offer language classes. So in a school I was in not long ago, uh, you had children studying. All of these are different alphabets, by the way. Uh, Finnish, Swedish, uh, English. Uh, Arabic was the next largest language, uh, Russian, and so on. So it's both the uh, investments in taking care of children uh, and the investments in a multicultural, multilingual uh, society uh, that uh, allow uh, the kind of equitable outcomes that occur. And finally, a word about Singapore. Uh, Singapore, when it emerged from independence, from England in 1965 uh, was described by many people as little more than a collection of swampy fishing villages. Uh, it uh, had no compulsory education. Relatively few people entered and stayed in school. Much of the colonial economy for indigenous people was serving uh, the British. Uh, Malay students who were the uh, indigenous people of um, Singapore had no education at all for the most part. Uh, and again, uh, today, uh, they are among the top uh, achieving countries in the world. Uh, the achievement gap uh, among students, including the Malay and Tamil minorities, has been rapidly closing what was a yawning achievement gap. Uh, one policy, of course, is equitable investments in schools. 80% uh, of Singaporean families live in public housing. This is not a group of wealthy individuals. Uh, but uh, downstairs in the public housing, which is, looks like the Bronx co-ops, these concrete apartments, when you come down into the bottom of the public housing area, they call them public, they call them housing estates, there's a beautiful school. And that school is outfitted with computers and texts and 
well-qualified teachers and also a thinking curriculum that focuses on innovation and technology and scientific discovery and so on. They've really overhauled that for all kids. So it's not like some students have uh, a basic you know, curriculum and others have an advanced curriculum. Again, in these places, the enriched equitable curriculum is part of the story. Housing estates also have to be integrated by language and culture. So a multilingual, multicultural nation uh, explicitly builds uh, multicultural, multilingual schools. Again, you have to maintain your mother tongue as well as at least one or two other languages. Uh, and the investments that are made uh, are made in the quality of education uh, that uh, young people receive. Malay students are entitled by uh, national policy to free education all the way through graduate school as part of the way by which the achievement gap uh, and the income gap are closed. So it is possible in these places, each of which is about the size of one of our states, um, to make the kinds of investments in human beings uh, that acknowledge uh, the need and the benefit that everyone in society makes when every child is well-educated and when the school system operates not to divide, not to select and sort, but to grow up and develop all of the population for success. Uh, I think we can learn a great deal from an agenda that would fund schools adequately and equitably, as these do, uh, sharply reduce examination systems uh, that have led to less opportunity for many young people. Uh, these are all countries that are going in the opposite direction from the direction we have been going lately. Uh, all of them revise their national standards and curriculum to focus on higher order learning goals. Uh, they uh, have few assessments, but those that they have are focused on uh, problem solving and experimentation, so nobody's getting a dumbed down curriculum. Investing in strong teacher education programs and ongoing teacher learning and pursuing those consistent long-term reforms for equalizing uh, and investing in the public education system. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Linda, for your, those very thoughtful and you know, informative comments. Just a couple comments before I open it up for questions. And we asked our presenters to limit their talk, which they kindly did, so that we would have a chance to have questions, and if you, you'll have to line up uh, and speak into the um, speak uh, the microphone because this session is being streamed, whatever that means. Um, uh, so that means you have to speak into the microphone. But before I open it up for questions, uh, let me uh, make an announcement. The Sage Encyclopedia of Diversity is at the Sage booth if you want to see it physically, but it's also published. Uh, electronically. So let's give the uh, a panel a big hand, then open it up for questions. Okay, would, would you line up for your questions and direct them either to open the panel or to a specific individual on the panel? And we have about 15 minutes for questions. Hi, I'm Tracy Williams from Seattle Pacific University. Can, there, can you hear in the back? Say it again. I'm Tracy Williams from Seattle Pacific University. James, first of all, thank you. You make Seattle proud. Thank you. And Linda, I stand ready to run your campaign for Ed Secretary. <laughs> Ladies, you were phenomenal scholars and models of what this conference is really all about. So one of the things that I wonder is those of us who are teaching this work and teaching our teachers to be better in schools and more active in our communities, how can we get more of the stories of the people who are doing the work out into the world? Your scholarship is leading the way, and some of the folks that we're teaching are doing some of this good work. So we don't need James to put another tomb together because we're using this wonderful one, and it is wonderful. But what are other ways we can get these stories out? Who want to take that? Use, be sure to use the microphone. Thanks for that question because it gives me a chance to say that. Can you hear her in the back? Can you hear Marilyn? That one of the ways I think the knowledge and experiences and work of school based 
teachers and leaders has has a chance to get out there is through uh, the, the research that teachers and other practitioners do themselves. So we have accounts that are in book form, that are in article form, uh, written by practitioners who have done research about their own work and who have taken up these challenging questions and tried to theorize them from the inside. Um, and if I could do a free advertisement, I think it's tomorrow. We have a session, which is also a presidential session, uh, and it's, um, it's Education and Poverty, Why We Need the Knowledge of Practitioners, or something like that. Um, and so we will have teachers and school leaders speaking about their own research over the years, trying to take up these challenges about educating people in poverty. So that's one place, I think, through these more formalized attempts to uh, make sense of what's going on, uh, describe it in a way that it is engaging and compelling to people, and theorizing from the inside. So that's just one example. Come to that session. I'll figure out when it is, and then I'll tell you. It's tomorrow, oh, you? Monday at 2.45. Okay, Sonia, or Linda, uh, our anybody else want to take that one? Okay, let's go to the next question then. Hello, thank you all very much for your scholarship um, and your leadership. Uh, my name is Gavin Luter from University of Buffalo, and I'm just wondering, several of you, if not all, sorry, I didn't do all my research, are on the National Academies of Education. So I'm curious to know um, whether or not your position to actually make a change in the way that we actually carry out our education policy to make the kinds of changes that you are talking about here, because I think the National Academy could serve as a great platform to actually influence policy and practice. Thank you. Well, Marilyn Dr. Smith is very active in the Academy, and Linda Darling Hammond are very active. Uh, one of you want to respond? And you as well. Yeah, but I'm chairing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> also called ducking. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the whole issue about the translation of research to, pra to policy is a huge issue. I'm going to actually be talking about this at the Division L meeting later today uh, because it's not so simple as just doing the research and publishing it in a journal that other researchers read and then hoping that somehow it finds its way into the minds and hearts of policymakers. Um, so the National Academy of Education has done some really productive work, sometimes summarizing um, knowledge in ways that make it more accessible um, to policymakers, um, sometimes making the uh, knowledge, you know, sort of uh, making consensus about issues available to practitioners. We did a volume, many of us on this panel, preparing teachers for uh, a changing world, which sort of took the knowledge base about teacher education, has been taken up by a lot of teacher education programs as a way to um, examine their work. Uh, and by credentialing commissions, uh, but it's not a direct line. And so I think what we can encourage um, organizations like the National Academy of Education to do, uh, like the National Res Res Research Council to do, the National Academy of Sciences, um, is to try to help the research community speak more clearly about what it knows, because it sounds to policymakers like a cacophony of voices. You can always find research that proves your point. Uh, you know, it kind of leads to that idea that it's all uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? That, that uh, Mark Twain characterization. Um, and so to the extent that we can get clearer about the weight of, what the weight of the evidence says uh, and make that kind of information more uh, routinely available in the policy discourse, uh, to that extent, I think we can play the role that organizations like that can uh, contribute. Uh, but it's going to take also a lot of individual researchers uh, being willing to go out of their comfort zones in terms of reaching out to policymakers to offer access to that literature and being able to write in a way that is uh, short, pithy, accessible, and in the places that members of the policy community read. Next question, please. Oh, I'm just, sorry. Just to okay. add, uh, agree with Linda, but also add one of the things that the National Academy does is to sponsor with the Spencer Foundation dissertation fellowships and postdoc fellowships. And I think increasingly the, the topics of that research that is getting funded 
has to do with many of these issues that we're hearing about today on this panel, about equity, about diversity, about poverty, uh, in the US and in other nations. So it, it's not a direct line, but I think a lot of the young people who are being supported through National Academy Spencer fellowships are, are working on some of these very, very important questions. So that's another thing that I think the Academy is doing. Thank you very much, yes. Michael Washington, I'm a doctoral candidate uh, attending San Diego State University and Claremont Graduate University. Uh, I appreciate the work of the panel and uh, I uh, wanted to point out a question that directly ties into the condition of poverty. I currently uh, teach and have for several years taught adults in correctional institutions, jails and prisons. And I'm curious as to whether uh, many of you on the, on the panel may be able to speak to the issue of the prison pipeline and what we can do to address this because obviously when you're a poverty stricken criminal behavior and deviant behavior looks a little more appealing than the average person. You got it, Tom. Well, I just number one want to thank you for bringing this up because it is perhaps the issue um, that many communities are facing today and many states are facing today. Uh, while we bemoan the fact that we're no longer first in the world in achievement or attainment or college attendance, we are first in the world in incarceration. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's inmates. We have more inmates than all of China. Uh, that is both a result of, you know, uh, criminal justice policies, sen sentencing policies, and so on, but also it intersects with education. Uh, most inmates are functionally illiterate and high school dropouts. So the student that we wouldn't spend $10,000 on in a year in Oakland, uh, we spend $50,000 on when he is incarcerated in California. Uh, those corrections budgets are taking up more of state coffers now than public higher education budgets in many states. So it is a huge issue. Um, and there's far too little investment going on for education in the correction system. So I want to take my hat off to you for your personal work in that arena. I think it's um, <laughs> I think ultimately, you know, this this is also this pendulum is beginning to swing. Um, speaking about California, you know, we're finally having a conversation about different uh, approaches to corrections, to incarceration, and to investments in education. Uh, ultimately, the kind of thing that Governor Jerry Brown talked about a couple of days ago, which is uh, an investment in a much more equitable student funding formula for schools that will allow us to spend the money that's needed in high need schools so that we don't have to spend it later in that system is going to be a big part of the answer. Agreed. Most of the uh, most of the correction education programs are in adult ed programs. Uh, education is in trouble. Adult education goes first. It's an alternative program. So I appreciate your comments. And if anyone else has comments, I would love to hear them. Uh, 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 Dr. Nieto has comments. Thank you. Sir. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that we also need to place this within a broader context that um, incarceration is a black and brown issue. You know that if we had this population of white middle class men in prison, we would do something about it. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, my name is uh, Sachin Maharaj. I'm from the University of Toronto. I'm a student there. and I also teach uh, at-risk students in Toronto. I had a question about high needs schools. And um, it seems to me, although we want all our teachers to be highly effective, that if we were serious about equity, we'd have our best teachers teaching our neediest students. So I want to know sort of the role of teacher assignment in uh, addressing some of these achievement gaps and also what could be done to increase retention at high need schools. You're probably the best. Well, I'm, happy to, that one. I'm happy to say a word and I'm sure other sure people will want to. Um, the fundamental problem of uh, staffing high need schools in this country starts from the unequal funding systems in most states, which then lead to unequal salaries and working conditions, which means that, again, if I could just use Oakland as an example, you will earn $10,000 less going to teach there than you will if you move five miles up the peninsula and teach in a wealthy district. 
and you'll have a larger class size and you will get to spend most of your own buy most of your own supplies and materials and equipment and that's true in many many states across the country so we construct um, an inequitable platform for recruiting teachers um, and then uh, you know we often have churn because of the combination of the poor working conditions uh, and the lower salaries and the fact that there's less resource put into training and mentoring um, the teachers in those districts and so it's harder work and fewer of them stay so if we want to fix that we have to do what some states have done, what some districts have done, which is first of all, raise the salaries so that they are comparable to those in other districts, um, put in place the mentoring programs that are needed in order for people to feel well supported when they get in there, um, introduce things like urban or rural teacher residency programs, which train people coming in in schools uh, under the wing of the best urban teachers or rural teachers who really know how to work effectively in that context while they're getting coursework that is integrated and allows them to earn their credential so they're rather you know rather than being thrown in they're being really mentored in to build a cadre of leadership in those communities uh, and i think uh, some places have demonstrated how to do this work boston has been one place that's done it denver san francisco now has such a program um, states like Connecticut have um, done the equalization of salary uh, in the past. Uh, we've got to do that on a large scale because otherwise we're just continuing to feed the problem. So just quick follow-up. So then on the funding issue, do you think a move away from local funding towards, say, a centralized model that, for instance, Ontario, uh, the way Ontario does it would address some of those issues? Uh, yeah, I think ultimately we need to do what other uh, what other countries and states in other countries do, which is fund the schools equitably. You know, we've had this sort of myth since the 1980s that inputs don't matter, only outcomes matter, and that if you really want equity, you have to test, the testing brings equity. Somehow that more tests will, um, you know, magically create equity. We've seen that that doesn't work. We need to provide equity with a base of resources uh, and add more resources for the education of students who live in poverty, uh, for those who are new English learners who need specific kinds of investments in um, the curriculum, uh, and for students with special education needs. Um, it was one of the first things Massachusetts did in the 90s that propelled it to its top place in the rankings in the United States. They have backslid since then, and states do continue to backslide after they respond to school finance um, lawsuits. But it is ultimately what we have to do. Sonia. Yeah, and I, I want to add also that it's not just about money, that there are many teacher candidates who are afraid to go into communities of brown and black people. And so it's about teacher education, and it's about uh, preparing them to, well, the title of my new book will be Finding Joy in Teaching Students of Diverse Backgrounds. You know, how do we do that? We have to work with the, yes, with the funding, with all the policies, with all the practices, and with the hearts and the minds of the people who are going into education, because survey after survey has found that the majority of teacher, uh, pre-service teachers um, who are European American want to teach in communities like the ones that they came from and in schools like the ones that they went to, and that is not going to happen. And so we have a real mismatch between where they are and where they're really prepared to teach. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Reina. Um, I'm from SUNY Buffalo. I just defended last week. Um, 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 I feel proud of being a stu Korean student um, as a student who is coming from one of the highest high achievement nations. However, um, historically, Korea has been known as one of the most homogeneous society. Uh, since 1990s, demographics changed rapidly, and um, students and children from minority families are having a problem and difficulties adjusting in Korean society. And more than half of those students um, drop out of the public school and do not finish high school. And um, surprisingly, um, those students 
test score is not included when we calculate um, <laughs> total uh, score of the test average. So my question is, should I still feel part of being a Korean student? <laughs> and what do you think about the Korean? I hope, is there any Korean uh, professors or policymakers from Korea? I really appreciate your question. I don't know the first thing about Korea, so let me just preface my comments by saying that. <laughs> but I think the larger point, and this is a universal point, and that is the point of the incorporation of the other in, in educational systems around the globe. And particularly when we think about racialized and ethnic forces in this society and how they permeate the school walls, it illuminates for us the necessity to go beyond just looking at the material or resource context and look at the softer, intangible, harder to measure processes that make it very difficult for children from very different backgrounds to become deeply incorporated, engaged, and to learn, to be healthily incorporated. And we see these patterns in what we know, and this is what helps us understand why context matters. You can take the same ethnic group of kids and put them in a context where they matter, where they belong, and they will thrive. And if you put them in a context where they are not seen, where they, where they don't get the sense that they belong, they will not thrive. There has been research that shows that. And I think it's a matter of our also paying attention to the softer structures and processes in education that will in many ways impede the educational advancement of many groups of students around the world. This is what this is about. So I thank you for that question. Thank you. I would, I would like our, I'd like to thank you for coming to this session and thank our panel once more. And